Today's video is presented by Notes and Clips. Head to notesandclips.com and use the code BEDAWA25 to get the largest current site-wide discount. Welcome to the panel where I look at the world through the frame of the comic book. My name is Jason Bedauer, artist on DC Comics, Joker Harley Criminal Sanity, and co-writer and co-art director of Artemis with YouTube goddess Lindsay Sterling. In this video, Scott and I will be doing an episode-by-episode -episode breakdown of She-Hulk leading up to what we believe is the best ending of any Marvel TV show. I have to apologize. Back when we did this, Scott's setup was straining under the Australian winter net. I've managed to save the sound even though the audio filter has given Scott an occasional lisp. To make it less distracting, I'll be showing you footage of me painting my tribute cover to Savage She-Hulk number one by John Buscema. If you want to see me drawing the line art, check out my previous She-Hulk video. You can wait to the end of our chat today to see the finished image or just head to my store at jasonbedow.com to see the finished cover where you can also check out my comics, my art, my writing, and all the things that I'm doing. I'll be releasing secret versions of the cover on my Patreon, where each level allows you access to exclusive prints and unreleased artwork. That's patreon.com forward slash Jason Bedow. And let's do this. Here be spoilers for episodes one to nine of She-Hulk. Please go watch this amazing show, then come on back. So let's get into my chat with Marvel Living Library Scott Stewart as we break down all the episodes of She-Hulk. We also stream on Twitch every Friday at 9 p.m. EST, 6 p.m. PST, or 1 p.m. Melbourne, Australia. Australia time. Please join us on twitch.tv forward slash Jason Bedow, and I promise Scott's setup is radically improved these days. She-Hulk episode one. What are your thoughts? Loved it. I was absolutely entertained by it, but you can see the mechanics of it. And part of that's the cause of the fourth wall break. And part of that's because a, a pilot has to do so much heavy lifting. But despite the fact that you can see the scaffolding and the kabuki guys in black shuffling the sets in the background and on, on how they hung the story together, it was so charming that it really works. That opening where she's giving this impassioned closing argument and the wake dude is heckling her and her and is cheering her on. It highly sets up the themes and the conflicts, the insecurities and Jen's journey. And then they know they've got to derail a little of that to satisfy the largest part of the audience who tuned in, which is to find out how this all ties into everything else. They explicitly tell the audience, we go and go and do this. But when we come back, it's a show about lawyers. And I'm guessing you're not going to be able to focus on this fun lawyer show until you know all about that. So let me get you up. To it, it's a little personal story. So we're going to go do this, have fun, but it's completely okay to get off if you're not interested after that point. I love that so much. The whole series is so meticulously constructed. I've, I've been really lucky to be involved in a whole bunch of very complicated things and written things myself and it is very hard to know what your audience is feeling at any time you think they're at certain places but you don't know if they actually are the confidence of which she hulk knows where we are at when jenny's able to talk with us with such confidence and such self-awareness that it's absolutely just it's on another level for me a lot of smart people thinking about story and story construction and then character evolution yeah the emphasis is on the character of jennifer through every episode as a prism for every story her reactions how the new reality was being shaped and that was the core of the show not the meta jokes or the uh, the slam boys action scenes when they came. Yeah, I was incredibly invested in Jen's story. I thought that she was real. That's what I loved about her. I understood Jen's relationship with everybody and the, the struggles that she's having. This person who's completely been dumped on, having some successes, and then everything just falls apart. Tatiana Maslany is an unbelievable actress. The nuance of performance that she gives it, it is the key to bringing it to light. If anybody hasn't seen Orphan Black, go back and watch Orphan Black, five seasons of a sort of pure acting performance wrapped up in a, a fun enough sci-fi-ish science conspiracy plot. She plays all different versions of one person. They're all completely different and recognizable as distinct individuals. 
even when they're pretending to be each I other. Did the, I want this girl hat. It's all to chat. I, I'm not sure I've ever seen anything like it. And she brings that nuance to Jen Walters and she hole I saw people complaining that they felt that it should have stuck with the comics and it should have come back to Bruce having to make a decision to give Jen the blood transfusion. I don't think that works because the show is called She-Hulk. It needs to be about her. She needs to be the protagonist. And back when Stan was hammering out that script 40 years ago, he, of course, is going to lean on the Hulk and bring the drama from Bruce's part. These days, I'd like to think Stan would write it differently now. Jessica Gaoma and the MCU certainly have, and I think they made the 100% right call by making Jen the protagonist of this. I, I read somewhere that the creators thought that the MCU Hulk at the point he is as a character, having gone through this explicit 15 year journey, is not willingly going to give his cousin the blood transfusion. It's that it had to be an accident. I was really happy with the origin that we got on the show. Just think about where she's mentally. Just in the last day, the amount of trauma that this woman has gone through. She's been in a massive car accident. She tried to do something good, backfired. Her blood was poisoned. Her body's changed completely. She woke up in the woods, had to sneak into a bar, then gets assaulted by four guys. Then she gets kidnapped by her cousin and taken to another country. Any one you could take to a therapist and they'd be like quite happy to pull apart for years to come. But all of these happened to her within 24 hours. And I think she takes it with pretty good grace for several days before she finally loses it at Bruce because she needs to get out of there. She wants to get out of there. If you want to go back to your life as a lawyer, I, I respect that. And again, when you're being lectured about rage by the one person who his tragedy is, he's probably the worst person on the planet to get Hulk powers. I, I thought she was pretty justified, but I'm sorry. Even her dad makes a joke. And you didn't destroy a city. <laughs> I haven't gone into too much of the Bruce Banner backstory in the MCU. There's a soft link back to what Terry Sanner established in the Ang Lee Hulk. Let's hit the gamma radiation. But it's surely acknowledged. So that's a whole thing that people just bring to the MCU with their familiarity with the character. Yeah. That comes from other media. And the Hulk is one of the only people from Marvel that you can do that with. Mm. That allowed them to take the shortcuts with Bruce Tan and never get into the, the icky stuff. Yeah. But there would be a lot of icky stuff. She feels at this point that she's tried to do a good thing. It isn't fired in her face in such a way that her cousin is saying you cannot go back to your life just when her life is looking so good for her i felt her frustration i felt her pain at the end of the day the hulk doesn't need us to stand up for him if mark ruffalo did not want to deliver those lines he would not have delivered those lines the, the mcu actors have a tremendous amount of sway if you've watched any of the assembled episodes when you just see the amount of sway that chris hemsworth has on a set he got his own daughter cast as Thor's daughter. There's whole points that he suggests that end up manifesting themselves in the movie. It'd be pretty easy for Mark Ruffalo to just be like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to say those lines. I don't think that's outside the amount of sway that Ruffalo has here. Yeah, I don't think that's a long bow to draw. Yeah. There's no suggestions. Ruffalo was unhappy with anything he was asked to do. This is just can fiction. At the end of the day, the way everything came across is also the way it's supposed to come across. Because Bruce is also right. It's one of those things that Jen has to also learn that when she brushes Bruce off then, and I think in a fairly justified way, it does come back and bite her on the ass. And I think it's one of those things that it's worth digging into. But she is also a very different person to Bruce. I, I think he should have survived a nuclear explosion in a fridge. And that would have made everything better. I think he should have survived a nuclear explosion, a gamma bomb. Full stop. What is with all these little stupid experiments? And where's Rick Jones? God damn it. Someone bring Rick Jones into the 
goddamn MC. <laughs> for those of you who don't know, very quickly, when Bruce Banner was about to set off the gamma bomb for the first time, he saw a kid had driven onto the test site. He drives down, he runs out, grabs the kid, and throws him into a ditch just as the bomb goes off, which is what turns him into the Hulk. That kid's name is Rick Jones. He goes on to become Cap's sidekick, the alternate for Captain Marvel. He's in trouble. He brings the entire Avengers together. I thought the fight with the Hulk was fantastic. And I'm sorry that I said a bunch of harsh but very true things. It really had that vibe of siblings hashing it out. Wow, an apology that still doubles down on a thing you're apologizing for. This show feeling like the mortar between the bricks. It's connective tissue. It brings everything together. It binds it together in such a far stronger way than anything else has done up to this point. The meta nature of the tone allows it to like respond to fan culture. Now it obviously does this very explicitly in later episodes, but here in this first episode, it acknowledges that Chris Evans is a sex symbol. Captain America As a result of America's ass. That is America's ass. It engages with the idea in a fun way. There absolutely is a double standard, and it is one of those things that you can do that to men, and I think it's okay. Suit did nothing for your ass. You can't do that to women, and I'm sorry. It's just the way we are as a society right now. Hopefully things will change. I don't know what direction. These things will change because things always yes. change. And with everything, it's about context. And we were to sit here and discuss uh, appearance in minute details. That comes with the cultural baggage of that thing and dehumanizing his cause. Or as long as I've been alive, it's all a conversation within a culture. And I always get into trouble. I am too dogmatic about an abstract principle and applying that to real life. Real life is a negotiation. Real life is a compromise. Uh, abstract principles and sticking by them are great. Everybody should have them and do that. But it's got to allow the fact that you're probably wrong, like everybody in human history. You can't proceed on a daily basis and map out your life, assuming you're wrong about your fundamental precepts. So when you're dealing with somebody else, when you're engaging with their lived experience, you got to allow for the possibility as you interpret that and, and, and take that knowledge on. Look, it's changing superheroes and, and, and to turn this into a deep point. I think the point of being fans of superheroes is believing that we can all be better. They set us an example, as simplistic as it is. A beacon on the hill, something to strive for. I don't think that's what the genre has meaning and relevance to people our age. I've, of course, that could just be grasping its straws and justifying the 12,000 comments I had. No, 100%. There was that meme that went around for a while that was like, how can you have read the X-Men and not tolerate people of different sexualities and races and genders? How can you read Superman and not appreciate what immigrants can bring to our society? There is all these deep level messages through these comics, meaning or not meaning, and people who keep politics out of my comics. Politics have always been in comics since Superman was shaking down railroad tycoons. I cannot emphasize enough how much I agree with what you said, Scott. I always say that the Marvel heroes are who we are now, and the DC heroes, heroes are who we want to be. It is absolutely the desire to just be a better person, to try and help, to make a situation even just like a little bit better. Isn't that what these comics teach us? It's because we encounter people who actually don't give a shit about that. Demonstrably do not care to be better people. A responsibility that comes with being one of the people that sees that and doesn't think it's the way things should be and do something better. I don't think I'm a good person. I think I think about it though. I try to apply lessons. To Spider-Man on down, what the, the Marvel Universe, real people with real problems trying to find a way to navigate the best outcome.
there are, there are always consequences to blew things up in their face. They didn't get what they want. They didn't get the treasure from on high. Life continued to have. That reflection of life is why the, the, the Marvel Comics universe is still here. And that's what I love about the comics, though, that they're encouraging us to be better. I would joke, but it was an actual truth. For me, it was like, what would Superman do? If I can use that as my beacon on the hill, if that is the ideal, but what can I do? And if it's somewhere between where I am now and where Superman is, then hey, isn't that better? As a final note to certain topics we've been discussing, I just like to say we all need to do better. We all need to consider other people and their situations more. Yeah. I, I think we're at a unique moment in history where men are actually privileged to get a better understanding of how women see us. And the onus is on us to take advantage of that opportunity. You don't have to agree with every criticism, but you should listen to it. Also, you are also not included in every criticism, but you have to be aware that the, there is a vast majority of men that are, and that by logical extrapolation includes you trying to be a good person. Bruce Lee is famously quoted for saying, I do not pray for an easy life, but the strength to deal with a hard life. I'm going to dodge them. continue to pray for an easy life. If that's it. Look, if I had to pull out the tweezers and start picking a tiny little things, the lab that Tony builds for Bruce is all Hulk sized, but Tony didn't know at the time that Bruce would ever be smart Hulk. So why would he build a Hulk sized lab? Why would he build a lab with a wall of Bud saws, chopsticks do not work with Cheetos because I defy anybody not to shovel those things into your face. Just the bag up and let it just all that cheesy synthetic goodness just pour into your face. That's may maybe, maybe that's just me. <laughs> Shall we do episode two? Titania. Well, Give me a Titania yeah. cover, Scott. This is my favorite of the one that I've oh, got. Nice. It's Kevin Wallace. Oh, yeah, he's the same artist that did that, did the cover with the blocks of. Shaving your legs and punching a dude yep. and finally a brush. I love that. And um, he's been the cover. He was the cover artist on the Charles Sewell run, and the Sewell run was really fun. It doubled down on the legal procedural stuff. Charles Sewell is a shoot lawyer. It was only a couple of years ago he finally shut down his legal practice to to write full wow. time. Uh, Nikki from the show. She holds a become. Who's your best friend? Nikki. <laughs> Spandex. Uh, her capital legal. Yeah. Her, her, her Bessie, her colleague, her subchamer, her creative and fashion inspiration. Nikki is dynamic and witty and I absolutely love what she was on screen. Doesn't come from a specific character, but she was combined. Patsy Walker, Hellcat, is Jen's PI assistant. Oh, really? A staple of 80s and 90s TV shows where lawyers and private eyes team up. And so they did that. And the Hellcat was the PI side. Oh. The personality and pushing Jen was coming from oh, that. Oh, that's great. Patsy Walker was originally in the pre-MCU romance comics that Marvel was publishing. That they then pulled into Marvel continuity as a superhero because she was already an established character that they were publishing. And became a superhero because that's what happens when you go into the Marvel universe. And all of that already done so well in Jessica Jones season two. Australian actress Rachel Taylor right. as Patsy Walker. What did you think of Titania in the She Hulk TV show? With the exception of the therapy group, they rehabbed every character they introduced. Titania in the comic, she appeared during Secret Wars. She and her friend once well, transported them and for some reason doing what she and her mate would make competitors in the superheroes. In this scene that was basically ginned up to sell an action figure line. And and Marvel had no villain for She Hulk to fight. So Titania was involved. And yet another classic IP serving move. So fittingly. Titania has been a long-running nemesis of Jen. She doesn't get a lot of covers. It's a slightly better look at how she appears in the comics. Very purple, big red hair, which obviously a Janilo channel, but that, that outrageous wig. She is probably most famous in the comics, so for being married. She and Crusher Real, the absorbing man, 
are married in the comics. For those unfamiliar, here is the absorbing man. I just, I got set up again. <laughs> there needs to be another term. When someone gets rickrolled, what, is, what happens when I get quasar rolled, quasar two roll I get quasar <laughs> <laughs> I just want like some comments. I just want some comments. Why do I always get quasar? Why do bad things happen to good people? Because <laughs> people like me do this. All right. That's the absorbing man. What is his power, Scott? What is it? What is Crush Krill's power? He um, absorbs things and takes on their properties. He actually turned up in the MCU. He was uh, an early uh, villain in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Yes, Mary McFerrin and, uh, is, is married to Crusher Creel, the Absorbing Man, and uh, had cancer, which Jane Foster cured. I really enjoyed Titania in this. I always felt that the Titania in the comics was very paper thin. So she's grown into a much more interesting character than she was, certainly back in the, the, that web of Spider-Man days, where she was just strong, angry woman who uh, happened to be married to a dude. There's been some good stories over the years. I'm thinking of Thunderbolts. I'm thinking of the full run. Which is why the cost of being married to a dude like Creel and uh, strives to... Uh, she worked with the Thunderbolts for a while, basically paying off his jail sentence. Mm. Painting the picture of, uh, of being a woman who loves a bad dude and got... It went down a bad path and, and, and looks sacrilege. Having a character that actually forces Jen Walters in the show to accept her identity as She-Hulk, I thought was really great writing. I loved it that they didn't give her an origin on the show. She just uh, was this person who did this and that's all you needed to yeah. know. And she has enough money and lawyers that she can fight an inappropriate use of superpowers charge, whereas everybody else gets indicted and shoved in a supermax. What did you think of the Wrecking Crew? Let's see if we can remember them all. We have the the Wrecker, Thunderball, Pile Driver. I can't remember the guy with the helmet. Bulldozer. Bulldozer. Thank you. How do I do three for four? Mate, you got Pile Driver. Easily <laughs> forgotten. The Wrecker is the front of the group and definitely the most famous. Yes. Thunderball is the more interesting character because he's actually really smart. Mm. The terror stories where he turns good and or works with the big guys. Quietly, so it doesn't ruin his rep. Now, to have bad boy nerd whinge about the show, it, they did the wreck and crew wrong, turning him into feeble joke villains. Because uh, the wrecking crew are powered by Asgardian magic. They go toe to toe with Thor and the entire Avengers. They're part, they're part of one of the great stories where the Masters of Evil invade Avengers Mansion and lay waste an entire history of the Avengers. And now we don't get those stories, because, uh, yeah, these dudes are kind of jokes. I said, the interpretation was great. I'm not mocking it. It's one of those choices you make in an adaptation, but there is that little disappointed nerd in me that we now don't get the Masters of Evil with the Wrecking Crew in it. Yeah, the Green rest. Gilligan's Island. Look, man, <laughs> they could always actually end up getting serious superpowers in the future, and we could maybe see them come back, and this is just the start of their story. Who knows? <laughs> so the, the whole plot of episode two is issue one of Single Green Female. It is Jen having to do a case for the DA that they managed to plead as a mistrial because she saves the planet and because the jury would be biased. She gets fired from the DA's office and then, oh my God, what's the name of the firm? Uh, 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 Goodman, Goodman, uh, and Holloway. And for those who don't know, Scott, reel them off. Martin Goodman was the publisher. Stan Lee it was Stanley Martin Lieber. And Jack Kirby was Jacob Kurtzberg. Yes. And uh, Holloway. Holloway. See, but that plot for the entire first issue of the Dan Slot wrote is exactly the plot for episode two of, of She-Hulk. And God, any anybody that gives you a map to the best bathroom to poop in, that's a ride or die for life. That is a person thinking, thinking about you. I love Pug. Oh, I was disappointed that we never got Pug's backstory in the comics. He's working as a bouncer in college is, and he gets jumped by a bunch of guys that won't leave a club. And he gets saved by Spider-Man, who doesn't stick around to be thanked. He just takes out the thugs and then disappears. And Pug's like, I'm going to move into superhuman law because I'm going to be able to protect 
the superheroes, the way that they protected me. But Invader, oh, I think it's one of those things that would have added an extra layer to Pug in the TV show. I absolutely agree. But of course, there's plenty of space to flesh him out in later seasons. And again, if this had been 22 episodes, there would have been a Pug episode. I'd really like to see more of him. Emil Blonsky, what was your take on The Abomination? Obviously very different from the comics. We saw his kind of classic appearance earlier. Here is Alan Davis <laughs> knocking it out of the park. Literally. Hey, I didn't mind it. Nobody cares about Emil Blonsky as a human being in the comics. He's, he's the comedy hulk. Yeah. Um, turning him into a, a thoroughly modern character. Uh, a disingenuous man who has a skill and reluctantly pulls it out for money. Getting Jim Rod just to do it, that's worth the price of admission yeah. alone. I think there are some times when you able to put together a character that inspires an actor of that caliber to come to the party and just have so much fun. It's one of those things that the fun for me was that I honestly didn't know if he was redeemed or not. Roth was doing this wonderful thing where he's being so earnest with what he's saying, but sitting like he doesn't care. And so you get this dichotomy between body language, between what I'm showing you and what I'm telling you, that leaves us and Jen in a very difficult place. But Jen is also of the, th of the belief that everybody deserves a fair trial and everybody deserves a chance to prove that they have debilitated. She said, I don't want to do this, but it's the right thing to do. I just... Again, to your point, nobody cares about the abomination when he doesn't have giant pointy fin ears and he's not punching the hole. And they made me care about him. So let's do episode three, The People versus Emil Blonsky. Wong. I, I can't remember the character's name. I'm terrible with names. But I love the relationship between Wong and Madison. the party girl. Madison. Madison. Madison Wong is Madison with two N's, one Y, but it's not where you think. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Which <laughs> the uh, Jessica Jessica Gow has was, gone on record <laughs> saying that she wished she'd known how good Patty Guggenheim would have been in that role and would have written in into the entire rest of the series. This is what I mean about She-Hulk being so good at filling in the gaps between when the heroes aren't out saving the multiverse. That Wong loves me, but he's compassionate and open-hearted enough that this complete stranger walks into his life and that he'll find a kinship with her. Absolutely charmed by this character. One of my favorite things on the second watch to stop on people's screens. And I love how Wong has a Facebook or a LinkedIn page that Nikki finds him on. He lists being the Sorcerer Supreme, the before that librarian at Kamataj, and then before that target sales assistant at Kamataj. Well, I got <laughs> it's a I missed out. <laughs> He went from Target Sales Assistant to Librarian to Sorcerer Supreme. Oh, I love you, Wong. I'm loving this sort of sleazy Wong moving through underground fight clubs and stuff that they've got going yeah. on in the, in the MCO. I just think this more uh, complicated character that is more of a real person than Doctor Strange is. I'd be way more interested in watching a Wong movie than a Doctor Strange movie. I, I, I think we'd all be yeah. here for Wongers. Yep, I think Doctor Strange should be a supporting character in a Wong movie. When we're talking about comic, accurate comic book adaptations, Wong is literally, and I'm quoting here, Doctor Strange's manservant in the comics, his token Asian manservant. And the fact that they've been able to give this character to Benedict Wong, that Marvel's, the MCU team, has elevated this character to just such a wonderful level is a huge testament to everybody involved. They've taken something that was just an untapped mine and turned it into something absolutely brilliant. There are some absolutely, absolute zingers in this episode. Just things like during the testimony of Emil Blonsky, one person was like, Now the library is more than just a quiet place to shift someone. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> Instead of toilet wine, prisoners make toilet kombucha. This is all stuff I missed on the first watch through. And on the second one, I watched it with subtitles because it just happened so fast. And even the judge where it's just like, Thor's inspirational speeches are not admissible in court. See, <laughs> admissible in court. Somewhere in that run, the Comic Code Authority put a stamp on comics 
And those comments became admissible as evidence in yeah. court, as historical documents. In in and when she gets uh, hired by GLK and H, she goes. She walks through the building, and in the Superhuman Law Division, they have all these Marvel comic books there. And because they have the Comic Book Code Authority, which is a federal institution, that makes them federal documents, and therefore admissible in a court of law. <laughs> Let's go to episode four, man. Is this not real magic? I love how self-aware they were. Jen's talking to us, and she's, oh my god. I love having Wong on the show. It's like giving the show Twitter armor for a week. God, everybody loves Wong. I just don't know how the majority of man children are going to feel about this show, and I just think they're just so clever about that. How predictable these people yes. are and how their talking points are genuine. One of the cool things at the start of the episode is that when Jen gets to work, she's scrolling through her to-do list for the day, and there's a bunch of things that I managed to pause on. On her list was our Kraft versus Saul brief, which is David Anthony Kraft versus Charles Saul. There's a Lee versus Byrne, which I can only guess is Stan Lee. Probably not Jim. There's a Jansen class suit. Klaus Jansen. Love a good pun. <laughs> that was that one episode where I was just like, there is no way Tatiana Maslany doesn't get me things. But I also do like that she's like, how is that a notification? They're so good. It was a good bit. It's not like it's just stupid either. It's like a piercing commentary on our relationship to these apps, to notifications, to our phones. Yes. It's, it's a two seconds and you can either get it and enjoy it or if it doesn't land, move yeah. on and the plot's still going and there are more gay. This is how sitcoms work. You just throw it all at the wall. Some of it sticks, some of it doesn't. You keep it coming at a pace that if it doesn't land, there's something else coming. It's also what makes it so rewatchable because it comes at you at such a pace. There are so many of these gags that I didn't get the first time that I watched it. That I only managed to pick up on the second time when Nikki finally gets Jen to get her to look at her profile. Is that your corporate headshot? Jen, what's your first date going to be? Webinar? <laughs> it's just... <laughs> this is so good. They're so on point. She-Hulk in the comics is a very broad dating history. And they are generally, apart from White Wingfoot, I think they're all the rest are very superhero-based guys. White Wingfoot, Native American gentleman who the FF met on their travels that was She-Hulk's boyfriend for, I think, the entirety of the burn run. Large parts of it. He was a really interesting character. But the yeah, burn did some great yeah. things. And that was fun. And even just Dennis is like, There's a hot chick over there. I'm going to go talk to it. <laughs> I was laughing this hard in exactly, exactly the wrong one. Oh my God. There's no bathos here. People are funny when they're being funny. They're funny when they're giving each other hell and they're never leaning away from the actual emotions. Jen is there for every emotion. One of the hardest things to do is write a, a, a joke-heavy script. Because you work with a script for weeks or months or years in some cases. And a joke is all about surprise, really. Mm. So you're only surprised the first time. And you live with this joke. And it gets to get old. It gets to get stale. Having the courage to leave those jokes in there and not work at the best. That's the secret of good it's comedy right. writing. Knowing when you've got all the first time and keeping it in there. In comedy, how directors and editors manage to capture the timing and the humor of it and then keep it. Once you edit and you cut things down and you're forced to get your runtime down and you're like, is this still funny? Even though I've cut a millisecond off this thing or pulled this out. I thought like the dates were really funny. Fun. The moment when he sees Jen in the morning and then his, oh, unexpected, I'm, I'm going to go in Jen's face, just fall, is why you pay Tatiana Maslany the big bucks. Yeah. I unexpectedly pointed absolute heartbreak, but our weariness to this isn't the first. And those are the moments that you really get to know Jen. Those moments where she becomes a real person, where you do start to understand those things that perhaps rubbed you the wrong way in those earlier episodes, are starting to become explained and understandable and empathize with. Let's burn through five and six. It's five, six, and seven. So mean, green, and straight poured into these jeans is probably not the strongest episode, but structurally dealt with 
all the elements they'd thrown up before. Just Titania, Pug and Nick. I thought it was just fun. It had the whole tension of her potentially getting a super suit. That was the drive for me that got me through the episode. Even having to figure out her wardrobe, because you don't see She-Hulk looking very good for a very long time, because as Mallory Book says, Not like a football player pleading no contest to a DUI. The clothing design of character was a lot of subs. Luke Jacobson, really great performance. Seeing the Daredevil helmet was like, come on, baby. Because doesn't it just make so much sense? He's a lawyer. She's a lawyer. Let's see them go at it, right? And one of the best things that I love about this show is the way that it manages its own tension. We want to see her in the super suit. We want to see Daredevil. And it sets up all these anticipatory things that kept me on the edge of my seat. I come back to the scene where people were like, oh, this is stupid, her and Megan the Stallion twerking. I, I, I don't get the rage about the twerking scene. That was such fun. I, I, you never acted like an idiot to music because you're happy. Right? Yourself. And, and again, the, sh the scene is so self-aware of itself where it's just I will kill for you, Megan the Stallion. Dial it back. Even the scene knows that there's a line. It establishes where the line is and that the twerking is not over the line. What's the word you keep using? Diegetic. Steve callback. It absolutely folds in perfectly with the logic that they've set up in the world. Ah, oh, people, no. just lynch for a minute. It's just having fun works. If you, you, you decided you're not going to something, that's fine. Right. Right. But you know, if you want to convince others, it's like actually arguments as to why it's bad, not just two women had fun in a way I didn't immediately react right. to based on the second and a half of trailer footage. I have a suggestion. Find things you love and use that energy to share them with people and spread the love for things that you love instead of trying to spread hate oh, for so things. You can get the so hard on YouTube. <laughs> no, man, we're doing this with a positive attitude. Find people who have different tastes to you and try and convince them of the things that you love. Try and find somebody else and spread joy for the things that people create that you love. If you don't like something, that's fine. Just move on. If you don't like She-Hulk, that sucks. I'm sorry. I thought it was the greatest thing that I've watched in Marvel <laughs> since Endgame and one of my favorite pieces of TV. Is it earth-shattering? Like, no. Like, I started watching Ted Lasso also. Is Ted Lasso a better show than She-Hulk? I think so. Sorry to say, but I think it is. Does it? But I think I love She-Hulk more. I'm a biased audience. Here's the, here's the thing. We're all a biased audience. There's no such thing as an objective review. There's no such thing as a take on a movie that is the truth. Yeah. Except, obviously, the Muppet Christmas Carol is the best Muppet movie. <laughs> it's got thrown down. If there is a hill to die on, found it. Oh, it's a nice, easy one to die on. <laughs> Which, whichever Black Knight is tilting up the hill is on the people of Stalky in history going after me for that. <laughs> We didn't pick up the entire run of Marvel comics. We just picked the ones we liked. I didn't shit on the ones that I didn't like. I just didn't buy them. I wasn't actively convincing people, oh, you should absolutely not read normal Avengers. West Coast Avengers is where it's at. The hate watching is so weird. Just go touch grass. Go get in touch with something that means something to you. Push the things you love, not the things that you hate. Criticism is absolutely valid. None of this dismisses discussion about something. But putting together an 11 hour YouTube video on why you hate the 90 minute popcorn movie is perhaps not using your life's energy in the way that will bring you the most joy. No, but it will bring them the most clicks and views. Anybody can tear anything apart. Very few people can build stuff. I don't have time for people who just want to tear stuff apart. You've got to contribute. We were talking earlier about how the MCU is now aging, like the original Marvel mm -hmm. Universe did, as the platform got bigger and people now have to pick and choose. This is another way that it's, it's happening. It's 2023. This is the fifth year of the Holy MCU. Holy cow, man. We're now talking about generational audience. There's a cool audience, which was up. And now there's the kids who were so eight when they first saw Iron Man. And they're now 26. Yes. 
Too. And those audiences see the whole thing very differently than we do. To be different generational audiences slashing into each other is another thing that makes the, the, the Marvel Cinematic Universe was blessed by just being a brand new thing done really well for the first time. But now we're getting all these different interpretations, these different layers, and these different ages of fandom that come to it. Miss Marvel is so cute. It's not pitched at me that I understood the spirit it was made in, and it's sweet. It was not pitched at you or me. We've all outed our ages out. But I tell you what, that first episode, I saw myself and my relating my fandom to my parents' generation. This is the wedding episode, and I love too that she's, this is coming at an inconvenient time, but that's how weddings work. They always come at an inconvenient time. They know, they're just so aware. I mean, they know that we know that they know that, and it's just, to me, that works for me. This was also like the most sitcom episode for me. It's a classic sitcom premise. You take the characters or you put them in a different situation that's highly stressed. He's doing a super villain fight, and it, it, it was just, Great. I also really love when Titania turns up. You are genuinely not certain if Jen is just being <laughs> paranoid or if Titania is actually up to get her. And the fact that Titania is not only up to get her, but Todd has planted Josh there to get her also means that her paranoia is not paranoia. It is completely justified. You're not paranoid if they're actually out to get yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. Let's do Mr. Immortal, man. You got the cover? Of course I do, Dirt. Unexpectedly, I have yeah, the greatest me, me, wait, Mr. Immortal cover pull it up. in comic history. Wait, wait, the Great Lakes Avengers. In the late 80s, they sent off the Avengers and put a team on the West Coast. And a few years after that, they did a little joke for each of just sitting at the team of losing superheroes unaffiliated with the Avengers in the Great Lakes. And in the spirit of Justice League International, the, the Great Lakes Avengers occasionally get a series and Mr. Immortal comes from there. It's his literal power. He can die and then he'll just come back for life. He has no other powers. He's just a dude. The Intelligentsia is an actual supervillain group formed by the leader and MODOK in the comics. The Retreat, Abomaste. All right. So what? Why are we looking at the Punisher, Scott? Punisher Word War Journal, number 25. Saracen appears in this <laughs> issue. Serious? Oh my God. From the self help group. There are some long vows to draw here. These are not like major league characters. This is the only comic I own that I know has a Saracen appearance. Is this Mike Golden? I think it is. See, it's Michael Golden. That amazing. Great call, man. Yeah, it's absolutely Michael Golden. He is so amazing. And he's so few comic pages. for dude with so much time. Who else you got for us? Oh my God, Tony Matt. Incredible Hulk 341. Eagle Eye viewers will not be the old school Tom McFarlane signing mm. just next to the Spidey box. He hadn't yet developed his iconic signature. Name. This is the Menbull. Wow, going toe to toe with the Hulk. And if we're going to talk about Manbull, we can't get past his not a little matador friend, El Aguila. <laughs> El Aguila. I do remember him from uh, the Marvel Universe entries because he's just under Aguila, Eagle, the Eagle. And he was right at the start, so I would always remember him because his name starts with A. That's not one of my comic comments. I don't have. The Power Man and Iron Fist <laughs> featuring <laughs> Eligula. <laughs> that would have been a good uh, cut. And unfortunately, nor do I have Tales to Astonish 48 Holy featuring Jack me rendering the porcupine in the costume. She appears in the show. Really is. And is an absolute one to one reproduction. I love the moment he takes his mask off and just sticks to high. Heaven. <laughs> 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 oh my god. I just loved her walking around with the no service thing, just a tiny dot in the distance with the no service over the top. Great storytelling. I also love too that when she meets the wrecker, that she's you guys probably don't even recognize him. Let's do it previously on. And <laughs> just because the start of the show didn't <laughs> 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 The only thing we really haven't 
spent time on is the cover I was going to start with. A gorgeous Russell Dorneman cover from just last year, showing she holds through the ages. All her many and various look from the Fantastic Four to the classic Avengers look, her monstrous She-Hulk. And then, of course, the classic That's Savage She-Hulk down the bottom. What a great cover. I love this. Oh, yes. Do you know what I love? Quite so. <laughs> Talking about the circle and all the supervillains, Kate Coira, I'm so sorry if I'm absolutely mutilating your name. The blocking and staging of the circle scene and the editing is so well done. It is so hard to have that many people sitting around a circle and make the camera feel energetic, lively, yet still have a sense of where everybody's sitting in relation to each other while not feeling like you're recycling the same shot again and again. Just brilliantly done. And then her popular girl speech, so good. I felt it was a completely new take on She-Hulk. We're talking about it being cheating, about being the popular girl. How did that resonate with you, Scott? It was definitely where SWAT was coming from. And it's not where any other take really came from. I quite like it because I mean, yeah, the yeah. show flips the Dan Slot run on its head because in the comics, she's obsessed with being She-Hulk. She refuses to go back to being Jennifer Walter. She's an Avenger, party girl. And then she loses her job at the DA's office because she saves everybody. She gets kicked out of Avengers Man. She's got to start paying bills. And she gets a job offer from K&H. But the stipulation is that they want Jen Walters. They don't want the She-Hulk, which is the reverse of the TV show. And in the comics, Jen is forced to actually be Jen and get to terms with actually being Jen and who Jen is and why that she's Jen. And say, I really love that structurally at this point in the series, she's forced to start accepting She-Hulk. I really like the take. But you're right. It's not resonant within comics. From, from what I remember about the original Stan Lee version, she was shy and retiring. And the, the version of Jen that I'm most familiar with is the one who is largely just she all the yeah. time. She's with the FF, she's with the Avengers, and she's just quite the competent and smart and calm and resourceful and Right. It's very true to the character of Jen Walters. That's the character of Jen Walters is not one that we always get with the character of She-Hulk in the comics. You're also referring to a She-Hulk that was decades old at that time. From the burn run onwards, I believe was in like late eighties, early nineties. He put Jen in the FF in eighty five when he was working on the book and got right here. Sensational She-Hulk two was June 89, mm. so it would have been May 89 that issue one yeah. came. 87 was when I started hitting the stands seriously. I'd had comics before then, but yeah, 89. Uh, I've done my vegetables. I want to get to the fun of it. Episode 8, Ribbit and Rip It, is hands down my favorite episode of television. As I said, I've started Ted Lasso. It is technically much better than She-Hulk. But when I talk about all the things that I like, I want to see in a TV show, when Luke Jacobson is being taken to court and his lawyer turns out to be Daredevil, of course he is, because we've seen his helmet at the end of, what, episode four or five? Look, I know Daredevil is an incredibly serious show, but it's so much fun to see Matt in this other light. And for those people that are like, oh, this ruins Daredevil, I don't think you realize the breadth of these characters and just how broad they can be. Daredevil is very schizophrenic as a comics character. It is the Miller run that everybody thinks is the core Daredevil, which is highly angsty and melodrama and with a capital M. But there's also this wacky, swashbuckling Daredevil. <laughs> Mark Wade left into it really well with his great run with Chris Samney. Um, devil is all things to all people in a way that very few superheroes are. And tapping into that red and yellow suit and, and making that work as an on-screen thing? That's an achievement, people. Even She-Hulk says making mustard and red working on a costume is just like, they make it work. 
like, and it's just to see that classic costume. I heard there was a great outtake where Charlie Cox had been walking around set and then we're about to shoot, let's put the helmet on. And apparently they're like, everybody or the entire crew just starts clapping because Daredevil's back. And it's like, the people who make this are fans too. They love this stuff. And I just think they did the character more than justice. Favorite Daredevil so far. Look, we'd already had the, the moment in No Way Home. Yes. Where he turns up as the lawyer, Matt Murdock. I just having him here in costume. I love the superhero misunderstanding leads to a fight, then they team up formula. Classic. I hate how little we've gotten that in the vast expanse now of the MCU. We've gotten it a couple of times. They just live in most of that. Point. So that complete misunderstanding where it's like, oh, no, your client is the bad guy. And again, to see them go at each other first as lawyers and then go at each other as superheroes. If I had to absolutely tweeze the episode, the only thing I would have done differently was to, to have the judge allow the client list to be revealed. And then Matt smells the jet fuel and is able to defuse the case from there. Would have just created a little bit more tension. But again, I don't know if a show like this is going for something like that. The other thing that I love too about Ribbit and Rip It is the chemistry between Matt and Jen. It is so powerful. When they're at the bar, where, when Jen leans over to us, just, who is this asshole? But I also love that it's Matt Murdock that becomes She-Hulk's Uncle Ben. He gives her mission statement. Maybe Jen can deal with society and She-Hulk can deal with those affected by the law. And that sort of becomes her mission statement and her mandate moving forward. I, I love the scene where he meets her family. Yes. Her dad was a character in a classic 80s sitcom. Oh, Perfect Strangers. And he, I he was Larry in Perfect Strangers. Which I was obsessed with when I was a kid. I can't remember any of it now, but I remember watching dozens and dozens of, of episodes. And holy cow, is he good in She-Hulk. Oh, he's amazing as that long suffering, good natured dad. I love to have family dynamic. He went around the table and there were all these like sitcom archetypes. And you just recognize them and you were able to respond to these sitcom archetypes. And, and also the fact that she has so a well constructed family in the comics, Jen's mom is dead. She only has a dad. And the fact they bring her, that she has a mom, that she has a functioning family. And even when she asks KVIN, what's with all the daddy issues? And the fact that phase four has had a lot of really positive father figures shows that they've definitely put that to bed with the whole Thanos arc. I love the insecurity of the KVIN. Who says that? <laughs> the only moment that, that broke me out of my Marvel Comics reverie, because everything is just so comic books in this episode right now is when she pulls Matt's mask off. You just do not do that in comic books. That is such an MCU thing to do. I guess it's a commentary on how the MCU disrespects secret identity. One of the things that I'd love to see James Gunn and the DCU going, do going forward is secret identities to really play with that trope of superheroes that Marvel has just absolutely sidestep to get to make these real people balancing secret lives i also love too where he talks about the difference between henchmen and goons how you know the goons are in for the paycheck but the henchmen believe in the cause i also love how all the goons have crossbows it's absolutely in the sort of in that <laughs> leapfrog would force these poor guys to have rather than actual guns i was so happy that they got together just having seen everything that matt and Jen had gone through how miserable they'd been that they can find happiness in each other was just one of those things that made me so happy. And the fact that he's into her as Jen and more as Jen and not as She-Hulk was just awesome. Seems so mad, man. And I want to see Daredevil. A woman has needs. Historically, we've been light in that department. And it's true. There's been no sexuality in the MCU since Iron there's been some innuendo, but yeah, the only time we any, we saw consensual adults enjoying sex, that one roll around the bed with the reporter in yeah. Iron Man 2008. 
15 years ago. Yeah. And that kill a lot. Who smashes buildings? I smash fourth walls and bad ending. And sometimes Matt Murdoch. Oh. <laughs> And look, if you get the smash Matt Murdock, you get to be proud of that. I I also love too, just how self-aware it was, which is, what are you guys still doing here? Why is this episode still going? I thought we had a really nice ending. And then one of the things she's like, is there going to be a Red Hulk? She's obviously talking about Thunderbolt Ross, who who unfortunately William Hurt has passed on. And then she's like, am I going to get fridged? Which is a term from Gail Simone from Green Lantern. He came home and Green Lantern's girlfriend had been killed and stuffed into his fridge. And it was one of those points where Gail Simone, really popular, amazing writer, was just like drawing a line and saying, we need to stop treating the women in comics like this. And uh, it was a really powerful moment. So it's really great that she was able to call back to something like that. It was a really seminal moment in internet comics history that she was writing a comedy column and she chose to make some of this trope. It formed a complete receipt. Of you know, within modern comics, with with regards to women, damsels in distress, this cost off thing that Sal didn't to put process some of the the anger she felt about how comics treated her as an audience. I I think it's a really important moment and an evolutionary moment behind the sensibility that we get from this She Hulk series. Because as much as we've attributed this to Dan Slott and John Byrne was funny, but he was a bit leery. Mm. Whereas this series had a genuine female voice. Purely as a story constructionist, the more we can overturn roles and stereotypes within society and stories, the more stories will become unexpected. The more you will be excited by the things you read, watch, and creatively ingest. Because you won't be able to know what's coming. Getting away from stereotype, getting away from prejudice, opening the door to everybody just allows stories to become better. And as a writer, for me, that is the freshest area of, that I see to mine. Episode nine, whose show is this? Holy cow, man. Talk to me. What do you think? I absolutely love that he gave us Every little moment that you would expect for a big climax, but didn't indulge in that and didn't let the story down by doing that third act CGI bullshit. Yep. You know, if you wanted any of those moments, you got that moment. If you wanted to see the Hulk and the Abomination wrestle, you got that sure moment. That wasn't the point of the story. That wasn't the story you were watching. We got this things. See, did witchy, funny misdirection culmination to it that was absolutely perfect they struck a f***ing landing only emotionally character wise whether you think the whole thing is a success or not what they set out to do they achieved in that final episode I don't think even Loki's final episode lives up to the success of this because Loki's final episode is so concerned with setting up Hang for future stories and setting up Loki season two. Whereas this just said, no, we're going to nail the steaming. And did they? Love the crap out of it. And these last two episodes are just such a high for me. They're able to give everybody everything they wanted and yet ask you, is that actually what you want like literally to your face is this what you want and you realize no maybe i do want more and to have jen put forward her argument to us and kevin and and being this is what it's about this is what you want this is what's important and for me anyway i was very much yes and yes because i already got what i wanted and then now you're giving me more. I don't need to see two guys punch under a blue sky beam for an hour. I think you can not like the show and how it ended. I don't think you can say they set it up. They set it up from the first moment. The first episode absolutely sets up every state. So Jen to Bruce, even in the background, to the show as a whole. And then it comes to the end, and so much has happened in the meantime. 
which has developed it all, fleshed it out, stretched the ideas in various directions, but it still comes back and ties it all up. I'm absolutely in awe of that final episode. As it left me wanting more, it left me wanting 22 episodes. I've been right or die for sitcoms that I would have preferred the 12 or 16 episode. But I've rented 22 of this. One of those things that I can't get over how aware these writers are of where their audience is at. It feels so horrible to say that you do the balls on them, but it's like the audacity to know what it is that we want and to be able to ask us directly after giving us what we think we want and then being able to go, there's more. You're about to talk about the courage of the creators through the lens of having the balls to do it. And then you took a pause and you knew that wasn't the right way to express. That's the lesson of the show. Right there. Just take a moment. Think about how you approach these situations from a gender point of view. As a dude, how you don't see it the way that somebody of Jen Walton's size and shape and appearance does, and how different those situations are for you. And I, I don't know many women who get legitimately offended if you talk about the balls of that decision. But I know a lot of women who get tired of it always being framed that way as a particularly masculine thing. A hundred percent, man. A hundred percent. It's... Again, just take a moment to rethink and about what's appropriate to a situation. And I like to think that even me verbalizing my train of thought is perhaps a step in the right direction. No, we need those mental speed bumps yes. to stop those societal shortcuts. That's the pattern matching of the human brain, the patterns that we generate. We need to interrupt those and interrogate those to better engage with each other as people. There have been a lot of love letters to Marvel Comics since the MCU started. Sometimes they take the form of a costume decision or a line of dialogue or a casting choice. This one just bathed in it whole way through. I'm going to take your metaphor and be like, in the past, it's been winks and nudges, and this was a giant hug. This absolutely embraced Everything I love about being a fan of Marvel Comics. The comics, not the MCU, they're calling itself 616. That's garbage. The actual comics and what it means to love comics and love She-Hulk. I was absolutely floored by it. It was the it has been the only Marvel show that I have been dying to watch. I was there every Wednesday waiting for it to be like, oh, new She-Hulk. Yes. It's just, and I don't feel that way about television or even movies worked on spider-man nowhere home and i was curious to go see the movie and i enjoyed it nothing compared to this this was another level altogether i really hope they're able to double down that they're able to ignore the review bombs the crappy metacritic stuff you know what not everything has to be for you yeah. that's a okay Let's show you my finished artwork for my savage she hulk number one tribute cover what we have here is the original cover by john basima and here's the line work that I did as tribute to that cover. But let's get ready to see the colors. So here's what I've done. In color theory, warm colors like reds and oranges and yellows pop forward, while cooler colors like green and blue tend to push backwards. The challenge here was making She-Hulk and Jen come forward. The way I was able to pop her forward was to create a higher level of contrast in the central figure over the ones in the background. I've got two light sources here. I've got Wong's Sling Ring Gateway and also have the white of the sky, which I've kept from the original background. I'm going to show you some of the changes I made. The big one is I changed Jen's face. I found that this face just seemed a little apprehensive. Other things I changed, I moved the background down more to create more of a silhouette for She-Hulk to pop out. I moved my signature over to the other side because once I pushed the blacks back here, I was able to let the signature pop. I redid the logo. Had a really fun time with this corner box too. Very difficult to create those sorts of expressions while still being relatively flattering. Jen and She-Hulk 
are both drawn with a very different brush. I've actually used two brushes on this piece. The first piece is when I started painting She-Hulk and Jen, you can see I use this sort of rougher because I tend to aim for a sort of a photorealism in my work. I like this rough brush because it adds a lot of energy, but it also makes it feel less photo-y. But then I started working on Wicked and they required a very photoreal look. And so I ended up developing a brush which is inspired by Art Germ. This has a hard center and then a slightly soft edge. And you can see there the really rough feel around Jen and the smoother look on Bruce at the back. Why didn't I do a paint over of this? Because I also like the way that this separates Jen and She-Hulk from the rest of the painting. I hope you like it. That is my tribute cover to Savage She-Hulk number one. Thank you so much for sticking around and watching our breakdown. Lastly, and very not leastly, if you're still here, please consider giving this video a like as I get more and more into this YouTube thing. I'll be putting out more stuff at even better quality. And I'd love you to come along and consider subscribing or just go check out my MCU playlist. Check us out on twitch.tv forward slash Jason Bedow to see Scott and I chat live. We'd love to see you there. Thank you again. You might not know that I draw most of my art digitally, but when I draw something on an actual piece of paper, it brings so much more meaning to me. In an increasingly digital world, having something physical makes something so much more special. And with that in mind, I'd like to introduce you to Notes and Clips. This is a line of absolutely gourmet stationery. It's all hand designed and developed by two ex-software and IT developers. They want to bring you back to doing things with your own hands with something really beautiful. I know how hard it is to buy great presents for people, but Notes and Clips is now your go-to for amazing prezies. Look at these incredible stationary boxes. These are the perfect gifts, and they cover a range of interests and styles for anyone who only has to have an appreciation for beautiful design and construction. What about weddings? Is your partner to be doing all the work? Get them a stationary kit and the wedding planner bundle. After that, you'll be able to fly under the radar until you've got to put your tux or your frock on. And if you know someone who's into stickers, Notes and Clips has you covered. I mean, technically they're stickers, but these are next level. They're hand printed, artisan designed. I'm going to call them adhesive decorations. You could use them for planners, cards, put them in your kids' lunch boxes, or just anything you want to make look better or feel special. And that's the thing. Everything Notes and Clips has is the perfect gift. And when you gift them, either to yourself or to someone else, please use them. It's all beautiful. It's art, but it's all designed to be used. And with worldwide shipping and tracking, you will get your next set from the UK in seven days to most locations. You can go to their site, notesandclips.com, and it'll even convert everything from pounds to whatever your currency is. And I think their price point is a steal for the quality. So either their Etsy store or their website, notesandclips.com, I don't know where you're going to find handcrafted stationery at this price. I've used so many digital tools, but there's no replacement for something real, something you could see on your desk or on your shelf. And when you go back to basics, you should do it with something beautiful. Thank you, Notes and Clips, for sponsoring today's video. Thank you for sticking with us so, so long. It's been five hours of She-Hulk. We've talked for longer about it than I think the entire series lasts. I think maybe. We just did like a movie bob breakdown. <laughs> we're longer than the actual thing itself. Oh, oh my God. Godfather Al, perfect timing. Godfather Al, the handsomest young mates who are so great and would like to, comm to commemorate and congratulate their rise to head of state as a first rate heavyweight of industry incarnate. To obliterate and decimate the floodgate of ev evils who congregate upon their estate, which made them dedicated to demonstrate to the best of their mates that they'd never he hesitate to motivate and elevate those. They appreciate. So let's celebrate and venerate Super Jason Iron Scott, whose panels never fail to captivate. Man, is he watching the same shit that I think we're making? <laughs> I honestly <laughs> think we should just bail and turn this over to Godfather oh Al. God. He's clearly going to produce much better content than we will flap in our gums Holy for three or four hours. Oh, God.